All right, welcome everyone. Sorry for the delay. We were trying to go live on Facebook and that did not work. And so now we're live on YouTube for our stay at home series, the CYP Club. My name is Derek Rosso. We're coming to you live and we appreciate everybody joining us for this very important topic. We've got some outstanding local community leaders, seven of whom who you're gonna hear from in just a bit, uh, ranging from small nonprofit to a large umbrella funding organization. Um, so before we do a couple of uh, housekeeping notes, if you have some questions for our panelists, go ahead and add those to the chat. And uh, since we're not live on Facebook, which we will, we will showcase it live later on, we are on YouTube, um, you can also add some comments if you'd like questions. Uh, so again, the CYP Club hosts this every week, a variety of different topics and speakers and things that you can learn. Uh, but really for today, we wanted you to, to be able to listen in and learn more about what local nonprofits are dealing with and how they plan to navigate through the uncertainty and also maybe most of all, how you can help. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our two co-moderators, uh, Aaron Morris and Michelle Brueggemann, who are our uh, board members for CYP Club Cares. So Michelle and Aaron, take it away. Hi everyone. I hope everyone's having a great week um, heading into the holiday weekend. Um, I'm Erin Morris. I am the chair of the CYP Club Cares uh, board. Um, Co-moderator, Michelle. I I'm like pointing because, you know. <laughs> Hello, uh, everyone. I hope you're all doing great. Enjoying uh, your day off today, maybe for some of you um, for the holiday weekend. Um, so thank you all for being here with us today. We appreciate it. Today we are joined by seven um, leaders from various organizations. Um, we will hear from all seven today. Um, we are going to get it started. We'll start with Lisa Cortice from um, United Way. Great, thank you for having me. And thanks to Derek and team for always lifting up the nonprofit sector and for all that your organization does to support our sector. It's greatly appreciated. Um, you do a lot. So I am president and CEO of United Way of Central Ohio, and our uh, mission is to mobilize the caring power of our community to improve lives. And we raise monies to support the highest performing and best uh, serving organizations to help solve community problems. We've had a real focus on um, reducing poverty, and I'll share with you um, as I uh, give you an update from our perspective where we'll be focusing um, our future um, impact areas. So when, when the stay at home order um, was um, executed, we quickly set up a fund to raise money to help support the community. And I will just say that we were so uh, proud of our community and the way that they responded. And it just speaks to um, the caring power of our community and the generosity of donors. We actually heard from eight, we had gifts from 800 donors that we had never um, received gifts before. So that, so that just speaks to people really feeling compelled to be helpful during this time. We also quickly established a survey so we could survey our funded partners. We did it in partnership with the Human Services Chamber. And we, so there were a total of 85 partners. And this is real focused on uh, human services. So keep in mind, we don't represent the arts, for example, and the arts um, have really suffered. So when, when I'm talking about the nonprofits, I am just talking about human services, but there's a bigger issue here um, that it, we all should be very concerned about. So we, we um, surveyed three times our funded partners so we could understand what their needs were and how we could help support them. And uh, what we learned was um, PPE can, is an issue and continues to be an issue. The ability to have masks is the number one issue and the ability to find masks. We actually uh, ordered lots of masks for the community and we've had ours confiscated when they've come into the country from the federal government, which can not, during an emergency can do that. They can confiscate and uh, that's legal and we're never reimbursed for it. So we have nonprofits trying to get masks but having them confiscated so that the federal government can have a stockpile uh, to, to help solve for our larger national emergency. Um, in addition, we learned that um, of our 85 partners, 
92% um, of them have had applied for the payroll protection program. And our community through our 85 partners received $48 million in support. The average gift to the nonprofit was 362,000. So that was critically um, important and has helped many nonprofits to be able just to get through this period. We also learned that 60% um, have had to cancel events um, and the major sources of revenue that have been decreased come from one fee for services. So if you're a child care center and you can't provide the service, you're not gonna get paid. Uh, fundraisers and then general contributions and donations. So it is certainly a financial crisis for our nonprofit partners. And we also learned um, about the digital divide. Uh, we know that in May, uh, Columbus City Schools hadn't heard from 50% of its students. And we heard from our nonprofit partners that many of them had trouble working digitally because they didn't have the technology that they need or and or their, the, the people that they're providing services for, and that's an alarm that says I'm up to four minutes, so I will quickly wrap up. Um, the, the people that they're providing the services for um, didn't have the technology that they need. So I hope that this solves for a larger issue about the divide, the technolo technology divide, but right now it's very real and exists. So our greatest concern as we head into the new normal is we don't know what the new normal will be. And PPE has helped the nonprofits. The CARES Act funding will be flowing, but we are in for a, in for a tsunami of needs our community has never seen before. And we don't know how to prepare for it. So what is the new normal is for all of us every day to be really nimble, collaborate, and be highly, highly um, responsive and be good listeners and work well together. So I, that's my wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I think that is so important that in these very difficult times that everyone is facing that we continue to be flexible and um, we're able to adjust to the changing needs of our community. I think that's a really great point. Um, from there, we're going to toss things over to Angel Harris, the Executive Director at Dress for Success Columbus. Angel? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We're so grateful to share a little bit about what we do with you today. You know, at Dress, we've been empowering women to achieve economic independence for 13 years in this community. We provide our women with career development tools, a crucial network of support, and a tire that allows her to be successful and confident in working in life. I've always admired the work of Dress for Success and have had the chance to live my purpose leading this organization for almost two years. You know, I don't go farther than five steps outside my door at Dress for Success before I see a phenomenal woman determined, preparing for her career development courses or being styled for an upcoming interview. And it just fills my heart with joy. And I'm grateful that we get to be part of her new story as she steps out of poverty and into economic independence. And we get to partner with a lot of the organizations that you'll hear from today. You know, our women's stories remind me of my story. And as we implement innovative solutions to help our women, I think about what did and what would help me. A network of support, education, access to sustainable employment opportunities with upward mobility, because I wasn't always the well-educated, unflappable professional that I am today. I had my own struggle as a young woman living in a low opportunity, low income area. And I laughed because I became the master of the code of bus routes to get where I needed to go. And most of the jobs that I took as a young woman were either downtown or on the west side because that's where the number six bus went. And that's what came near our home. So mobility set my destiny early on, but I am determined for that to not be the case for our women. So the new normal for us means meeting women where they are and where they're gathered using a human-centered design approach to our programming. It means board recruitment and building a leadership pipeline with a focus on diversity. It means bringing client, the client voice to our board table. And it means grooming the next generation of leaders as well as our staff to ensure we're bringing our women our best every single day. 
I was so elated when I read the Rise Together Blueprint for reducing poverty in our community. And I'm so grateful to our Franklin County Commissioners and Franklin County Jobs and Family Services Director, Joy Bevins, for designing and implementing that plan. As a leader, that gave me a playbook to work alongside other community partners and to focus on achieving race-based outcomes and to help the broader community understand how race plays a part in all facets of our community. It made me rethink everything. What we were doing six months ago will not work today. And I have a board of fierce women who are committed to moving the needle in the lives of the women that we serve. We are so excited and what we don't know, we will seek out from partners who have the knowledge and know what we need. So our community actually can't go back to normal because normal in our community was inequitable. During a time of this global pandemic and worldwide exposure, um, we've been able to see that systemic racism exists in our country and in our city. And it's even more clear how poverty is an isolator for our women. And then how COVID created a deeper social isolation for our women to keep them mentally and physically trapped inside their communities. So things must change inside of all of our organizations to truly ensure that we serve our constituents in a way that's right for them, not what's convenient for us. So our mobile career center that we're launching in August will go into neighborhoods, take career development, job opportunities, and suiting services to our women. So we're nimble and our processes have changed. Our fundraising has changed. The way we serve has changed and the way volunteers get involved with dress has changed. Some of our longtime volunteers are part of the COVID vulnerable population. And so we've pivoted and created opportunities for them to serve virtually, making calls to thank donors, asking for support, teaching courses to our women online and reaching out to encourage our women because they are dealing with this stress that you couldn't imagine because of the interconnected issues that poverty thrusts upon them. Our young leaders have stepped up in a way that is phenomenal, just rallying wonderful women across our community in a phenomenal way. Our YES board, um, our Young Executives for Success, help us package looks for our women, accept donations. They hold a seat at our board table to help guide our decisions. We're so fortunate to have them. And I will be remiss, and I'm on my last 30 seconds. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't mention the talented group of more than 25 community leaders helping us plan our virtual dine drink dress gala. It was voted best charitable gala in 2019 and we have a phenomenal experience planned for this year. You can text dine drink dress to 25456 to learn more. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Angel, for sharing. It sounds like you guys are doing such great things and definitely you know, shifting to um, you know, bring the services to your um, women. Um, can you repeat the, um, the text number um, so I can throw it into the chat? Absolutely. Text Dine Drink Dress to 25456. 25456. Perfect. <laughs> I'll put that into the, the chat. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for sharing. Next, we're going to throw it over to Matthew Goldstein, the founder and CEO at Beza. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be on this call with uh, the two leaders that just went. Lisa and Angel are both uh, people that I greatly admire and respect and have been uh, such a big influence on BESA, as well as the, the people that are, are going to speak next. And it's great to be with everyone that's also on the call. Thank you for being here. Um, BESA launched in 2012. Our whole goal is to make it easier for people and businesses to connect with the community in powerful and authentic ways. A lot of what we do, what the community knows us for, is volunteer engagement. So you can go to our website and within two clicks, sign up, show up, and have this incredible experience around giving back. Um, since 2012, we have engaged over 50,000 volunteers in over 100,000 hours of service and have made over $22 million of impact, uh, primarily here in Columbus, about 85 to 90% of what we do is in Columbus. Uh, and then the other percentages outside of this community with some of our partners like L Brands Express, Jenny's Ice Cream, uh, Cover My Meds. Um, the opportunities that BESA does is all about capacity building. So we work, for example, with my good friend Angel at Dress for Success and her team. 
uh, to expand the hours of operation so that more women gain access to the incredible services at Dress for Success and all the services that Angel just shared with us. Um, we do that with a number of partners. During COVID, one of our partners is a food pantry. Most of their volunteers are retired people, uh, people that can't volunteer during COVID. And so we went from volunteering there once a week to essentially volunteering, volunteering there Monday through Friday uh, so that the pantry could stay open and provide services and not just provide services, but expand. So for example, Poindexter Village uh, is a senior retirement community. A lot of the seniors get their food from the food pantry. They can't go there, there during COVID. So it's best of volunteers that are boxing up the food, driving it to the senior community and, and distributing it to the seniors. That's the kind of work that BESA is doing in our community and, and across Columbus. Uh, Franklin County Public Health is another example. They distribute thousands of pounds of food to various distribution sites around the city and BESA volunteers are there um, boxing up the food and putting it in the cars. I was there a couple of weeks ago and there were about 200 cars in line and it was everyone from you know, young families with little kids in the back of the car to senior citizens with the handicap placard um, and everyone in between all there for the same reason to gain access to food. And it requires volunteers to make that happen. There was a New York Times article recently that said that nonprofits across this country have to shut down because they don't have volunteer capacity. It's one of the primary reasons they're not able to do the work that they need to do, uh, which as Lisa shared a little bit ago, that work is, has always been important and it's more important now because more people are accessing nonprofits uh, because of COVID. As an example, BESA, um, during the state home order, we had something like 700 volunteers get to the front line through BESA and support, you know, be it at the food pantry and, and, and through the shelter, excuse me, shelter system, et cetera. That's fantastic. That's 700 people that were mobilized, but it's four times less the number that we had this time last year. And a big reason for that is, you know, if, if people aren't comfortable volunteering, if they don't know the expectations in terms of safety, they're not gonna go out. And then there are a lot of companies who used to volunteer a lot, you know, let's say Nationwide would send their employees to the food bank or to Life Care Alliance, um, 30 employees five times a week. That's not happening anymore. And those hours add up quite quickly. One of our corporate partners does 10,000 hours of service a year. This year, they'll do half of that. And so when you start adding up those numbers, that's a lot of resources taken out of this community. So right now what BESA is focused on is trying to understand what does the landscape look like as it relates to volunteerism? What are the um, barriers to volunteer both for individuals in the community? One of the big ones is just understanding what are the safety measures that nonprofits have in place. And then also understanding what are those safety measures that are in place and then communicating that to the greater community as well as corporate partners so that we can start to increase volunteerism. And we see it happening. Companies are starting to come back and volunteer now more because um, they're better understanding one, the need, and two, what are the safety precautions that are in place to keep their employees safe. So that's really exciting. Ways that people on the call can get involved uh, with BESA is go to our website, givebesa.org. You'll see 30, 40, 50 different volunteer opportunities there. You can sign up, show up, do good. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, my email, I'll put it in the chat, is matthew at givebesa.org. We're always looking for more people to, to join and, and help expand. We work with about 100 nonprofits right now. And so if you're engaged with a nonprofit that's not engaged with us, by all means, we'd love to talk. We'd love to chat to talk about how can we mobilize people behind your mission. Um, one last quick example of that. The city, uh, as Lisa was, was sharing earlier, uh, you know, we're, we're, there are a lot of, there's a lot of need for masks. And one way that we're getting masks is the city has purchased, I think it was 30 or 40,000 masks. And um, they needed a way to package those masks to get them to the neighborhoods that needed them most. And so within 24 hours, BESA was able to mobilize 25 volunteers to package those masks so that they could then be distributed through the Human Services Chamber. Um, and so that's the kind of work that we're able to do in the here and now. There's a lot of need, there's a lot of uncertainty, but there's also a lot of opportunity. And that's where we choose to focus our attention is how to bring people together, how to see that opportunity and then mobilize around it so that we can confront this, this crisis together. Thank you very much for having me.
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matthew. I know that Aaron and I and the rest of the CYP Club Cares Board have also been working on that challenge of how do we communicate to those volunteers who would normally come out, you know, and know that we're taking their safety in mind. So that's a big challenge for us as well as we are hopefully going to start um, having more in-person volunteer events within the next few months. Um, next up, we are going to kick it over to Oyama Garrison. He's the president and CEO of A Kid Again. And um, I know his organization has a very unique challenge um, during this time as most of the families who are part of their organization are dealing with um, family members who are high risk. Oyama? Well, first and foremost, just want to say thank you to everybody in the CYP. Absolutely appreciate the work that you do in the community uh, and certainly bringing all of us together so that we can provide a little insight in terms of what we do and how we've all had to pivot in some respects, given the current climate that we're operating in. Uh, as stated earlier, my name is Oyama Garrison. and I have the honor, privilege and pleasure of being able to serve as the president and CEO for a nationally growing organization called A Kid Again which in three days will be celebrating its 25th year of service in the community. And so we've got a lot of really exciting things planned. So what's A Kid Again? A Kid Again is a nonprofit organization that is focused on providing hope, happiness, and healing for kids and their entire family who are facing and battling some level of a life-threatening condition. And what we do that is extremely unique in terms of this particular market that we operate in is that we also include the siblings, the parents and caregivers and others whenever we happen to go out and provide what we call adventures. And so I'll explain a little bit about that. The intent behind A Kid Again is to create a community, a community of people who can get together and rally behind what I like to say is a really simple four letter word and that is good. The ability to do good, to be good, to execute on good, and candidly to be able to provide smiles on kids' faces. So what we do is about once a month, we get a group together, can be anywhere of 20 to 4,000 people uh, to go out and have these wonderful, wonderful adventures in our communities. Places like going to an OSU football game, going to Cedar Point or Kings Island, things that many of us might take for granted but the kids that we work with are the ones that typically are facing some level of life-threatening conditions that also have compromised, some of them, compromised immune systems. And the average care, the average care to take care of a child battling a life-threatening condition is anywhere from four hundred to $600,000 a year. So they don't typically have discretionary income to go out to the local movie theater. They don't typically have discretionary income to go to the local zoo or to go to some of the amusement parks. But that's where the generosity of so many of our partners come in, so many individuals, including those who are part of CYP, come into play to help us be able to provide these adventures for our families. It typically costs or runs about $35 per child or per attendee to attend the adventures absolutely incredible opportunities over the past several years. And I got to tell you, we've got a lot in store. Even in the midst of this pandemic, one of the things that we had to do very quickly on, on March 13th, when the orders came down, our team was able to really quick pivot to what we call virtual adventures and adventures in a box. And so what is that? That is an opportunity for families that are in quarantine for the most part and at stay at home orders, Give them an opportunity to really still engage and have some fun within their local homes uh, and be able to engage with others on social media. And in doing so, uh, we launched the world's largest and probably the first virtual, if you will, magic show that was put on by one of our local facilitators, John Petz. Absolutely incredible. We had probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 different countries represented on that particular virtual magic show. Uh, we had launched our adventures in the box just this past weekend. Uh, we had a number of families come out. We had over 1000 families who received our adventures in the box kits that allow them to have these great opportunities to do things that are creative in their homes uh, and in their local community. I gotta tell you, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, our volunteers have stepped up. Now, one of the things with a kid again, 
Uh, and we always welcome people who want to be able to get enrolled and participate. So whether it's a family that wants to uh, be a part of the Akit Again organization, or if you yourself, you yourself are interested in volunteering, we have a, still a ton of volunteer opportunities. One, requir one requirement when it comes to volunteering with a kid again is because we do work with kids, we do require one additional level of screening when it comes to our background checks. So that's why we have to filter it through a third party system. But at the end of the day, we've got well over a few thousand volunteers across the organization doing phenomenal work to ensure that smiles are on these kids' faces each and every time they can get out or each and every time they get an adventure in a box or get that virtual adventure opportunity. So if you wanna make what I call a meaningful difference and help create some memories in the lives of some of these kids who candidly may only be with us for the next, could be three or six months, we invite you. And if you happen to know a family that is battling with some level of a life-threatening condition, please send them to our website. We only have two criteria to be a part of the Akit Again family organization. That is the person must be under the age of 20 and their physician has had to diagnose them with some level of a life-threatening condition. That's it. So thank you for your time. Thanks so much for sharing. It sounds like you guys are doing such great stuff. I want, a, I want an adventure in a box. <laughs> Uh, that sounds so fun. We've gotten a lot of requests. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like Derek threw the link um, and, and, uh, to your website on how to get involved. Um, so definitely check that out. It sounds awesome. Next, we're going to hear from Ruth Lomax. She is the Managing Director of Development at City Year Columbus. All right. Hello. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Derek. This is um, a panel. I have been so inspired just listening to you all. So this has been really exciting. Um, and, you know, the, the times that we're in, I think inspiration is necessary. Um, so City Year. So City Year, for those of you that don't know, we are a national education nonprofit. Um, we are served by AmeriCorps members. So when you see the iconic city year jackets and you see those young folks 18 to 24 serving in our community, those are AmeriCorps service members that sign on for a year of service um, to serve in 29 cities uh, nationally. And we have two international affiliates as well. Um, what this did for us during COVID, um, so March 13th when the orders came through, we had to quickly figure out and pivot and mobilize. When I say on a dime, it was literally, it was a feat that was unimaginable really, because we needed to figure out, first of all, to make sure that our 18 to 24 year olds um, were safe because many of them, our service members were impacted by the closures. A lot of them work in the sector um, that we saw the amount of closures. So restaurant workers, things like that, retail. Um, so we needed to make sure that we were meeting their needs. So something that we did at City Year Columbus is we established a pantry through our generous donations from our board members and we were able to supply basic needs very quickly for our core members and they were able to access the pantry in a way that was socially distant um, but it was also a time for them to kind of come they could they could see other folks. So it was something that they really looked forward to. And it was a way for them to access things that they might not have had the supplemental income to um, secure during that time. So things like water, spaghetti. We had lots of spaghetti. That's why I say it. it's kind of an inside joke. Spaghetti, spaghetti sauce, um, just staple items. Um, hand sanitizer, things like that. And so then what we needed to do was create a plan because what does virtual service look like when you're not able to serve in schools? So we needed to kind of figure that out very quickly. Our, 
our impact team um, created a plan where our service members would be able to do professional development, things like that, that they could access um, on their own and they could access virtually so they were still able to serve. Thankfully, we were able to get funding through the CARES Act and funding through some of our partners that are on the phone, so through United Way and through Columbus Foundation, because we, to Lisa's point, we were one of those nonprofits that were affected um, by not being able to host our event. So we had um, to quickly figure that out as well. So we had several several moving parts um, during March and April. And then we needed to see what was it going to look like to serve in school. So once we figured out how we were partnering with Columbus City, um, we were then able to figure out a plan for our, our core members so we could still support um, and we could be there for the students that needed us. People don't really understand, and I think Lisa had mentioned the digital divide. So the digital divide is something that is very real. And for those of us that work in service, um, we see this all of the time. And I think what COVID has shown us is that, you know, there are such inequities. And so we were able to really kind of look at that, figure out a plan, and what we ended up doing is we would serve in whatever way the, stu the students and the teachers needed us. So we had 57 AmeriCorps members that were deployed to serve virtually. Um, we serviced 530 students through virtual programming. Now, normally we serve 4,000 students across seven high need um, systemically under-resourced schools in Columbus City and that went to 530. So for various reasons, students weren't able to log on. You know, there were several different barriers. We were able to support in 41 classrooms virtually. And what we did um, as core members is we made phone calls home. So we did about 1,551 phone calls where we could just support, we could support parents and students with any needs that they may have virtually. We also did things like hosting town halls with um, the Columbus City Schools that our team members were deployed in originally. So maybe you were at South High and, you know, they wanted to create some kind of a town hall where they could have parents log in as well as students um, and just kind of see like, what are some of our academic needs? Like, what are things looking like? So we, we were very creative. We were doing all kinds of things where we were still interfacing because our core members, honestly, they wanted to see their students. Um, and that, that is such an, an important part of student experience. Um, we were really concerned with the loss of learning and just kind of the continuity of service and making sure that we were able to still um, interface with those folks. So we did lots of creative things like that to make sure that we were still meeting the needs of students. As we look forward um, to what the school year looks like, we are going to be nimble, as Lisa said. We are going to be nimble in whatever way we can serve. We are dedicated to doing that work. Um, I think thinking about where we are in terms of this racial unrest and just kind of this time in, 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 in our um, in history, I think that what's important to do for city year is to think about what we were originally founded on. And we're a social, social justice agency. Um, and so really kind of leaning into that work as well, making sure that we are meeting the needs of black and brown students daily um, and what that may look like for the future, we don't know, but we're ready to um, meet the needs as they, are, as they are addressed and as we see them, you know, as we see things kind of unfold, um, so. That's a little bit about what we've been doing, and we're just really grateful for this um, this forum to be able to kind of talk about what we've been doing. Great, thank you so much, Ruth. It's so so great to hear about all of the amazing work that you and your team members have been doing to support the needs of our. Uh, school children during this really challenging time and, and supporting those teachers who need it now more than ever. Um, this has been a really unique experience for them to have to figure out how to be able to keep that um, learning going 
you know, when they're not able to be with their students, especially when we do have that digital divide. Absolutely. Um, so up next, we're going to have Marcy Williams. Marcy is the executive director of the Ohio Association of Nonprofit Organizations. Thank you so much for being with us today, Marcy. Oh, thank you for having me. We are very excited to be um, joining all of you today. Um, we go by the name OANO, that's O-A-N-O, because the Ohio Association of Nonprofit Organizations sometimes seems to be a little overwhelming and a mouthful. Uh, we were started in 1994 by a group of nonprofits and sector leaders who really felt that a statewide organization um, was needed. So we're celebrating our 26th year. Um, I'm sorry. We're celebrating our 26th year. OANA's mission is to provide leadership, education, and advocacy to enhance the ability of Ohio's nonprofit organizations to serve their communities. So we want to strengthen them. OANO adopted the standards for excellence in 2001, and we're currently a replication partner. All of our trainings and our resources always lead back to the standards for excellence to help organizations with capacity building. We have sessions on board governance, human resources, financial and legal, grant writing, fundraising, marketing, and uh, many more. Our trainings are not just um, practical and operation centric, um, but we also help our organizations with trainings on self-care and um, outcomes and measures, diversity and inclusion, unconscious bias, and more recently working through disasters and PPP loans and how to track those loans um, on QuickBooks. We cur currently have over 500 member organizations and there's always strength in numbers. So OANO has a group pricing and discounts on various services to benefit our sector. Um, we are also the voice of the sector in advocacy and um, we relay calls to action on the local, state, and national levels. We do a salary survey every two years, which is pretty helpful to organizations and it aids them in fulfilling their information on their 990. We um, collaborate with community leaders, funders, educational institutions, and all of our peers in many ways, including providing a nonprofit sector report. This year's report is going to be released in um, next month, and it shows that over 57,000 organizations strong, um, Ohio's nonprofit sector is a social and economic force. As the third largest industry, nonprofits provided over half a million jobs and $26.3 billion in wages. Nonprofits not only provide essential services that connect communities, they foster generosity through volunteering and charitable giving. Nonprofits exist to foster a greater quality of life for communities by providing collective goods and services that neither the market nor the government can provide. Additionally, nonprofits serve a variety of functions that operate to address the complex public needs of communities. OANO is proud to support these organizations and we believe that a strong not nonprofit sector is a strong Ohio. Um, one of the things that we did notice right away when um, on March 13th was um, the amount of information. It was information overload. I mean, 700 emails a day, webinar requests um, to join webinars, um, requests for uh, speakers, for people to participate, advocacy. So OANO took, spent a lot of time going through and vetting webinars and vet, vetting those requests so that we could present to Ohio's nonprofits the best ones and the most up and coming ones. Um, and, and keep everybody up to date on the most current information. I think you saw 
how every day the PPP program was changing constantly. And you would be on a webinar one day and the very next day on the next webinar, they already had different language or they had uh, different requirements. So we really tried to stay on top of that for everybody because I know we were feeling it. So I know everyone else was feeling it as well. I see one of the biggest needs in um, the nonprofit sector moving forward. I think it's always been a need is board members. We truly, truly need good board governance. We need um, to strengthen our boards. We need uh, more, um, more uh, different skills to be on boards. We need certainly need um, greater diversity. So I would love to have that conversation with anybody that's interested um, and um, see how we can get you set up with a nonprofit that you're interested in. You know, start out, we call it dating a nonprofit. You start out with um, uh, joining and being on a committee and volunteering, and then maybe moving into a board position and hopefully into an executive um, position on the board. And OANO is always looking for board members. So I would love to talk to anyone that might be interested. And thank you again, everyone. This is a, an honor. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Marcy. If people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way? I would say um, you can go to info at oano.org um, or reach out to me directly, mwilliams at, at oano.org. You can always go through our website as well. Perfect. Thanks so much for sharing. It sounds like you guys have a lot going on. I definitely um, can relate on the different information every single day. It was always like you say one thing and you're like, oh, wait, that's not even it anymore. Mm -hmm. I definitely understand. Perfect. We're going to throw it over to our last presenter of the day, um, Chris Donovan. She is the donor services officer at the Columbus Foundation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today and spending time talking about everything that's happening in the nonprofit sector, it has been a wild ride for everyone. And I think the community is as much of a benefit that comes from things like this as the information itself. So I'm, I'm glad that everyone is here together uh, and also so, so grateful to hear from the leaders on this call. This is exciting. Uh, and I think a lot of us are looking for hope. So it's nice to hear a little dose of it here. Uh, at the Columbus Foundation, our mission is to assist donors and others in strengthening and improving the community for the benefit of all of its residents. What, what most nonprofits are used to interacting with the Columbus Foundation are, there's two main things, the competitive grant making process, which you've probably worked through, Dan Sharp and his team, our community research and grants management team, uh, and nonprofit professional development. We have a lot of ongoing events, plus people are many, many wonderful, wonderful people are involved in the big give and the big table. The other side of the foundation's externally looking role is what I do, which is the donor services side. So my role is focusing on donors working with philanthropic advising and support. So opening and managing their funds, helping them to make their philanthropy more effective, so I am coming to this conversation with a very much donor services and donor stewardship perspective. So I'll share a bit about what we at the Columbus Foundation have seen in terms of giving, giving trends, um, a lot of exciting things in the last couple of months as everything has been changing. I think it's good to talk about what change is happening and what, if anything, we can predict for the future. So uh, we hosted, along with some of the other partners on this call, we hosted, um, a review of the Giving USA data for last year, just a few weeks ago. And there's a lot of great points in there, but one that is relatively intuitive that, that came up again this year is that people tend to give more when they feel financially secure. So when the stock market is up, GDP is up, personal incomes are up, and the stock market tanked in March. It dropped 35% in a month. And yet giving to the Columbus Foundation increased giving out of donor advised funds increased. Uh, I think giving to a lot of nonprofits did not. So, or I won't say all nonprofits, but I think there's some really interesting points to think through with that data. So we at the Columbus Foundation saw an increase in the total number of donor advised fund grants leaving the foundation. It was up by 81%. Nationally, dollars out the door from donor advised funds for March and April was at 52% increase over last year. So money was moving more quickly, which is good. It was getting out into the community. 
Uh, we also launched an emergency response fund and um, to date, well, as of mid-May, it had given out $4.5 million in grants. That is just what came through the Columbus Foundation. Lisa already talked about United Way had an emergency response fund. The Jewish, Jewish Columbus had one. The Catholic Foundation had one. There may have been others that I'm missing, but money was moving, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. And then we had the Big Give, which generated $32 million in two days. And I, I, I believe me when I say that we were just as surprised as you. We hoped it would be successful, but we never saw that coming. And it was thrilling, frankly. So I'm, I'm happy that the money moved. This all happened as the stock market dropped and rebounded. It's now close to where it was, but we're still in a recession. And so I think this raises a, some really interesting questions for nonprofits of, are donors, are donors done for the year? Did they speed up their giving to give it all in the first half? Have they spent their philanthropy budgets or do they still think, no, no, I'm, I'm going to do my traditional year end or whenever they give? Um, I have no idea is the answer to that. I cannot answer that for you. I, I raise the question and I encourage great communication and great donor stewardship because I have been asked more in the last three months than I'm relatively new to the foundation, but my donor services colleagues say the same. We are getting asked more frequently, who should I give to? Uh, and you know, don't, you know, don't inundate me with how great your organization is because I just go ask Dan anyway. I ask Dan's team, so continue to co communicate with them. But donors are asking who is doing good work. Uh, and a lot of it has been about COVID and about racial justice because those have been so important and so present lately. But the more that you are getting your message out about the incredible creative changes, I mean, I want an adventure in a box too, right? This is, an, this is a great thing that there are so many smart, creative ways that you have pivoted. And so figuring out how to communicate that out to donors so that hopefully they don't think they have spent their philanthropy budgets for the year. They want to give more and they want to give it to you. Uh, but that every fundraiser knows this, every executive director and CEO knows this, donor stewardship is key. It is always so hard because you're just trying to keep your head above water, especially now. Um, I, I think this is a great time to invest energy in that if you can, and to recruit even just one board champion to do it for you because it's June, it's well, it's July. How did that happen? <laughs> it's July. We still have a long time before that Thanksgiving, Christmas, year end, whatever holiday rush of giving, get your message out there. You're doing incredible things. And I, I, I hope I am just slammed with having to process grants at the end of the year for all of you. Uh, so thank you for everything you're doing and for the hope that you're putting out there for me and for donors and for all of the people that you serve. Great, thank you so much, Chris. That was an amazing overview. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions for our panelists for about the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So we'll run a little bit over that 1 p.m. end time just to let everyone know um, in case you have to jump off. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of the challenges and things like that, but I would love to know from our, our speakers, what are some of the really encouraging responses that you've seen from the community during this really challenging time? May I, can, are, are we just allowed to just shout out? <laughs> so um, as a fundraiser, I, I realized I didn't really speak much about what we've been doing in terms of fundraising through this time. And um, thank you, Chris, for <laughs> kind of reminding me. Um, you know, I think that what has been absolutely amazing to Chris's point is just the outpouring of generosity. Um, we have seen an increase in donors and in, in ways that we, we, like what Chris said, we couldn't have imagined it. Um, the Big Give was wildly successful for City Year. We want to continue that momentum. Um, we want to continue the stewardship. We want to create advocates and champions. And I think that this time is really allowing for that. I think that, um, and disclaimer, my husband does work at the foundation. So um, I am, I am a little bit in tune with, you know, the fact that people are asking how can they be helpful and um, 
there are so many agencies right now and I'm like, just get involved, just go to folks' websites. There's so much good work happening. Um, and so that in and of itself is really encouraging um, purely from just like a fundraiser standpoint. Yeah, if, if I could jump in on behalf of a kid again, I gotta tell you, there was two really outstanding uh, components that took place. The first is when we made the pivot, we ended up, and some of you may have seen a post that came over uh, that I put out on social media because candidly, I'm usually a very optimistic person and continue to be, uh, but sometimes I will stand on top of the soapbox when it comes for advocacy for our families. And one of the things that we saw was tremendous amount of hoarding that took place early on when um, the orders were delivered and people were stockpiling all kind of what we'll call unnecessary resources. Well, many of our families were, who are the most vulnerable in the community, were very much in need of a lot of the things that people started to stockpile, which meant they weren't able to clean the tubes that sometimes were necessary uh, for the kids or clean their medical equipment or whatever the case happens to be. And the outpouring of support from so many people who provided the necessary resources, we ended up delivering in about the span of two days, we ended up servicing over 300 families getting them disinfectant wipes, getting them alcohol, getting them alcohol wipes. And a lot of these were just resources that were provided to us and the generosity of so many people in this community and then also providing financial support so that we can go out and procure items wherever we could. And so for that, forever grateful. And then the other piece is, is when we actually started the Adventures in the Box and we had this concept, this idea and saying, hey, you know what, what can we do to help these kids and these families just continue to find some glimmer of hope some glimmer of happiness uh, throughout this entire process, so many people stepped up to either donate uh, and support, to come out to help put the boxes and kits together. Absolutely tremendous. And people just found joy. I can't stress this enough, enough joy and good and being able to just simply do good. And so thank you to everybody that's uh, tuned in and candidly again, even with the Human Services Chamber and the Columbus Foundation, and so many other partners out there that rolled up their sleeves and said, hey, let's come out and let's help support and let's make sure that we can show how strong we are as a community, even in the face of all these uncertainties. You know, Aaron, from our perspective, it was a, on top of all the great work that we've been doing over the years, we launched two new programs during COVID. Um, one program is called Boss Girl, where we're working with young women 16 to 18 to help her with the self-efficacy that she needs to be able to make great adult decisions. And so um, in partnership with Cover My Meds in Franklin County and led by Dina Strategies who helped design and, and execute the curriculum for us, we were able to have 108 young women come together in our program, young women that are now working on their resumes, young women that have taken their resumes and are now working out in the community. And we have phenomenal boss ladies, you know, women who are heads of industry in our community who took the time every week to sit down and talk to young women about um, what they were doing when they were 17, right? And how they didn't have it all together and giving our women the chance to see what they can be as they turn into adults. And so I'm so grateful both to Dina Strategies and to the amazing women who gave their time to help our young women develop what they can be in the future. If I can just add to that as well, I think that um, the response from funders, funding agencies and foundations, um, and the fact that they were flexible, they gave us some extended time on reporting, um, and they were allowed us to um, repurpose some funding to go towards other items um, because we had to cancel programs or trainings because they were in person and we weren't going to be able to do that anymore. And um, so we were very grateful for those opportunities. And I know that um, most of the nonprofits that we work with definitely felt the same way and they appreciated the flexibility. Great, thank you so much. And we just got a really great question in our chat. Um, I'm gonna direct this to Chris. So Chris, given the crisis emphasis on hunger and housing, is the Columbus Foundation pausing its donor recommendations to service nonprofits that are not addressing crisis needs, but are addressing the ongoing needs of the community? Great question, because 
COVID has changed the needs of the community or has highlighted new needs and made them worse. The other needs are still there. They haven't changed, uh, but it, it has brought other things to the fore. So, um, I mean, the, the short answer is, is no, we, we aren't pausing recommendations to others. The approach of the Columbus Foundation broadly and how we work with donors is, is donor driven, right? It's, it is the same thing that all of every fundraiser learns donor centric fundraising. It's when we, we don't really do fundraising per se, but very donor centric service. Uh, so if a donor asks me who they should give to, I don't think I've ever just been asked who would be great. I've been asked who is great in the realm of serving survivors of human trafficking or in the question of who is doing really critical basic needs COVID responses, we would answer that question. Um, and either way, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think I have ever said, here is this one organization who you should fund. I, you know, I send three, four, five, and say research that you should make this decision. This is not up to me to decide where your money should go. Um, but I appreciate that they want our insights. So there are absolutely donors that that are still interested in funding the arts through COVID, and they should. I mean, if that's what their passion is, then we let, you know, we we of course we let them do that, but we. We encourage that, that the idea of the donor driving their philanthropy is, is critical in all ways, but especially that's our focus at the, at the foundation. So I, I mean, I essentially follow the donor's lead. Uh, whatever they're looking for is what I will respond with. And sometimes it takes a few follow-up questions to find out what that means, but that's also just the nature of, of working with donors, period. Good question, Alan. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Um, kind of a question for everybody. Um, is there ways that um, people can get involved remotely um, in case they're not wanting to you know, come back to an in-person volunteer event with a whole bunch of other people that are just not comfortable with that yet? Um, do you have remote volunteer opportunities? Well, I know that um, Matthew will have some great ideas, but uh, we do have Volunteer United on our website. And our, our, our partners, our nonprofit partners, um, many of them have posted virtual uh, opportunities to engage with them. So I encourage people to check out volunteerunited.org. Um, yeah, I, before I answer that, I just wanna go back to what Oyama said about he's an optimistic person. Um, you gotta be an optimistic person to be in this work, right? And, and um, you know, just hearing him say that makes me smile. And, um, there are a lot of challenges we face as a community, but it's the people on this call, be it the nonprofit leaders um, or the people that, that are listening in that are the ones that will help lead us through this crisis. This community has been through so many different types of crises before. Uh, we're not, this is nothing new to us. And so we'll get through it. And I'm excited to do it with everyone on the call. In terms of virtual volunteering, BESO launched the COVID response page. And so you go there and you can see ways to volunteer both in person or virtually. And that can be, there are 50 plus different, they're like, like, they're like little, um, little libraries, which I'm sure many people know about, but they're little pantries uh, mm -hmm. that are all over the city. And so we have a map that outlines where they are and you can in your own community on your own time, uh, fill those. We have a supply drive that has um, 20 plus different nonprofits on it. And so you can drop off safely supplies to a nonprofit or do the Amazon wish list delivery to them. Um, blood drives, which you do individually through the Red Cross and blood is so needed right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I mean, behind me, I have over a thousand greeting cards that people wrote from home that are going to frontline workers that are going to include a little pen that says, uh, be the good. Um, so there are a lot of small ways that people can make a big difference. And like a greeting card with a pen doesn't seem like it's doing a big, you know, it's not as big as serving, let's say, a, a person that doesn't have access to food. But then we get letters back from an early, early learning center where the teachers got these cards and they said how they sat down and read every single card. And then they, they draped the cards on the windows. So every time they come in, it's like a little boost of confidence and, and, and love and kindness from the community to them and how grateful they are for that small act of kindness that they are seen and that they are heard. And in some cases, that's, that's what we can do that can be so powerful for people who are on the front line. Dress for Success is grateful to partner with BESA to expand our hours for volunteer services. So thank you so much, Matthew, for that. 
and um, other volunteers can also use that 25456 number and text volunteer. Um, and anyone that wants to make a donation can text empower her to that number as well. Perfect, great. Thanks for all of that. Um, we have another question. Um, Mark is asking, how can we engage more people to volunteer and hopefully get them to become donors as well? I know this always seems to be a need. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here from the Akitigan perspective and just share that we have a number of really great volunteers who then become donors. And to the question that was asked a little bit earlier, one of the ways that some volunteers can really help out is through fund development via, you know, whether it's the Facebook online opportunities or other peer-to-peer -peer fundraising uh, uh, opportunities, all those types of things continue to help support the mission and the vision of so many great nonprofits here uh, in Central Ohio. And even for a kid again, we've had a number of our volunteers who some of them may not be in a position where they can come in to uh, help put together the kits, if you will, for Adventures in a Box or to help participate in some of the things that we're doing. Uh, and so remotely, they find their creative. And part of that creative is to use their voice, to use their network, to use their resources to help generate some added revenue that would then allow us to continue to fulfill more of these opportunities for more families. There are about 40,000 families living in Central Ohio that are raising some level of a, uh, uh, raising a kid with some level of a life-threatening illness. 40,000. Wouldn't it be great if we can actually put kids in all of the, in the hands of all of those kids so they can go out and have some fun? Well, we can't do that without great resources and the opportunity to be able to fill those kits with goodies that would allow them to feel like basically a kid again. I mean, who wouldn't want to just simply have a moment where they can give their illness a time out? A number of our volunteers have found some really creative ways of being able to, like, uh, like Matthew said, just generating nice little notes on cards that we can then include in the kits and or just send out to a number of our families. So we've got a lot of really creative volunteer opportunities that people can do remotely. Just go check us out at akidagain.org and learn a little bit more. Great, thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here with us today. We really appreciate you coming in and providing us with so much great in information and also providing us with a little bit of uh, inspiration and hope during this really challenging time. It's so great to see that there's so much support still for all of your organizations that are happening in the community. If you maybe just had like a quick wrap up sentence to um, finalize the topic that you are going, you know, that we're discussing today and the support of nonprofits. Um, if you just wanna do a quick wrap up and then we'll kind of log off, I, we, that would be great. Well, I would say in closing, just remember that providing uh, services is really important, right? getting the resources, making contributions. But remember that if we don't have strong nonprofits, we can't deliver strong services. Mm -hmm. So please be open to unrestricted gifts, mm -hmm. to sending leaders at nonprofits a, a note of gratitude uh, because the people who are doing the service really need support. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd say, you know, together we can get to the new normal. There's really no going backwards for our community if we want to if we want to advance. But we together can propel women forward with your support. We're a small staff, so we need volunteers and supporters to make sure that we can do the work that needs to be done for our women. So take a few minutes and get engaged. We'd love to have you. And I would add to that. Um, thank you, Angel, um, because I was I was thinking kind of on the same um, trajectory. Um, but I would just say, you know, our students now more than ever need your support. Um, learning loss is real. We're looking at you know thirty percent of of reading, you know, being being um, stunted, basically because of the loss of learning for COVID, but a lot of these students were already at a disadvantage. So just get engaged. Um, you know, things that we take for granted, um, students are at home and they don't necessarily have supplies. So school supplies, things like that, those are ways that we could certainly um, get those supplies out to students. Um, we're, we're 
we're ready. We're ready for what the school year is going to bring. We're ready for what it's going to look like. We're there. We are, um, you know, we're excited and to, to move forward. So um, just thank you. And thank you for those unrestricted dollars. And I think, you know, to Lisa's point, that is something that nonprofits really need. So I'll, I'll just really quickly share that, you know, we, we live in a time where I like to say teamwork makes the dream work. And so when we work together in all the various sectors that we serve in, in the nonprofit, the for-profit, the civic, uh, the educational institutions, and we really rally our strengths together, there's nothing that can stop us. Right now in our community really, really needs us. They need us to stand up, to stand together, be strong and to provide great resources so they can continue to move forward. This pandemic and all these other things that we're facing right now is a moment in time. We will be much better on the other side of this. And I think I would like to add that, um, you know, find out what your passion is and uh, get, get out there and volunteer, whether that's boots on the ground, um, or helping, you know, the nonprofit sector has a great need for assistance with technology, whether that's social media postings and helping with their website. Uh, there's a lot of different things out there that are available. And once you know what your passion is, I can assure you, you will find a nonprofit that will, uh, that their mission will meet what your passion is. And um, we just, we will continue on and making our nonprofits uh, stronger with resources and education um, and advocacy and um, doing the march forward and making sure that um, we are collaborating with as many people as we can. Um, and we'll continue our support because we do believe that a strong nonprofit sector builds a strong Ohio. The only thing that um, I can add to, I mean, everything that was just said, it was just so beautiful and, and on point. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to figure out how to, to plug in and connect. And, you know, so many of us want to make the world brighter. And, um, you know, a good friend of mine, colleague, you know, said he, he's not worried about making the world brighter. He's worried about making his corner of the world brighter. And so, you know, on here we have six, seven different nonprofits. Um, United Way, BASA, Kid Again, Dress, et cetera, and the Columbus Foundation, right? That, um, um, and City Year course, um, and Oana. Sorry, I can't leave anyone out. Um, <laughs> but um, every single organization, there's an easy way if you go to their website to plug in and connect. Um, and that's, you know, United Way, there's, there's volunteering there, there's your volunteering at BASA. The Columbus Foundation has the big table, which is just all about community conversations. Um, with strangers, with people you might not know to build community. Um, and then, you know, all the other organizations that share their ways, including Magic in a Box with, with Oyama. Um, and so I would say just reach out to a nonprofit through their website and just start getting involved because once you start that journey, you're gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper and get more engaged and more involved. And then that's when we brighten the community even more. And I will close by co-signing all of the messages about unrestricted giving all the time, all the time. Uh, that is so important. Speaking more high level and, and, and hopefully, um, I, I wanna hit home that for all of us as individuals and as nonprofits, the path and the message that is best for us is the one that is authentic to us. Because I, I, I think as we all figure out what does the new program look like? How do we engage those donors and everybody else that we communicate with and serve? You can't do it that amazing way that your neighbor nonprofit did. There, we all have a different focus and a different tone and a different group of people that we work with. So figuring out who you are and staying true to that voice, I think is especially important as we're watching other organizations pivot really creatively and saying, oh, I should do that. Maybe, but maybe not. Uh, so I think having that reaction and saying, this is so fantastic. What is it that I loved about it? And what does that mean how does it map onto me? Uh, it, I think that's gonna be really important for all of us. And that's what donors respond to. I love when I get, I, a donor will just forward me an email they got from a nonprofit and I see what you all are writing and you're very good at your jobs. It makes me feel so good about your work. Um, so keep doing that. It makes such a difference. If you're yourself, people feel that. It's just like, it's just like anything else in being a person. Being yourself generates a positive response. Hopefully, and if it doesn't, then that's probably not someone for you to spend a lot of time with. Yes. Thank you 
all um, again for joining us this afternoon. This has been a really great conversation. Lots of good points, lots of inspiration. Um, again, everyone, if you want to uh, start volunteering, uh, all of their websites have been added to the chat. Um, so definitely grab those. And I hope everyone has a wonderful July 4th holiday. Um, definitely uh, live it up, not socially distant though, um, and wear your masks. <laughs> Have a great weekend, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.